In 1983, Doctor Who would turn 20, almost old enough to drink and rent a car, but in truth the show had already been heavily drinking for years. The 20th season would feature an element from the show's past and each story, sort of, yet at times seemed to be coasting along, creatively speaking. Makes a nice change for you not to take everything in your stride, I must say. Must you? To write. Today we will look at the six stories of the 20th season of Doctor Who. <laughs> The 19th season of Doctor Who had seen Peter Davison establish himself as the Doctor after Tom Baker's record-busting tenure. There'd been a move to a twice-weekly broadcast slot in the UK that brought with it a big boost to the show's ratings and public profile. The 20th year would be a celebratory one in many ways, with Doctor Who's fanbase and public goodwill about to reach its 1980s peak. Producer John Nathan Turner knew the 20th anniversary of the show would be a good way to increase the show's profile and interest more casual viewers to dip into the show. The 20th season would revisit elements of the show's rich history. Every story would feature something from the Doctor's past coming back to haunt him. We're not talking about unpaid speeding tickets, but returning villains from previous years. And you don't remember me? Certainly not. In Johnny Byrne's Ark of Infinity, some alien presence is trying to break into our universe from the realm of antimatter, using the Doctor's body as a way of achieving a bond. The High Council of the Time Lords have, after all of 10 seconds of tepid debate, decided there's really no choice but to execute the Doctor. I've had debates over what toppings to get on a pizza that were more passionate and considered and took longer than the Time Lords took to agree to kill the Doctor. And if you say ham and pineapple one more time, Frank, I'll cut you. Don't you understand? The Doctor was betrayed. It turns out the alien is in fact the Time Lord engineer who had originally given the Time Lords their power to time travel. Oh my God. Lost in the universe of antimatter, the creature known as Omega was desperate to return to our universe. Omega had first appeared in the show's 10th anniversary story, The Three Doctors, where he was a little theatrical and hysterical. By the 80s, he had become a curmudgeonly grump who's just discovered a pigeon has shat on his new car. Then you will not be upset to see her destroyed! Originally, Omega was meant to be called Ohm, which is just who upside down. But realistically, Omega sounds way cooler and less like a name you'd give to an electrical apprentice. Ark of Infinity reintroduces Tegan, who, after being fired, I'm shocked, is no longer dressed like an air steward, but instead embraces whatever look this is meant to be. Tegan was never actually written out last season, she was always returning. But here, the galactic forces of coincidence are at work. She just happens to wander into Omega's TARDIS looking for her possessed backpacker cousin, who's working as Omega's unpaid intern. Working for a Time Lord isn't all that bad, it looks good on your CV, though the hours are pretty harsh. Ark of Infinity had some location filming done in Amsterdam, for reasons best known to producer John Nathan Turner. I mean, it's cool and all, it's more interesting than running around the streets of West London. Doctor Who was not well known in the Netherlands at the time, so people seeing Peter Davison as Omega running around the streets with his face peeling off really thought that bloke from All Creatures Great and Small had let himself go. This story would see us return to Gallifrey for the first time in a few years. Gallifrey looks quite comfy here, there are more sofas than DFS and seems like a nice place to get a coffee served to you by a 700-year-old barista. The president of the High Council is the doctor's old teacher, Barusa. And of course, there's the head of the Gallifreyan Guards, Commander Maxill. Yes, most of you will know that actor Colin Baker would go on to take over the lead role in Doctor Who after Peter Davison left, but no one really expected him to lobby for the role so hard. I'm the doctor. His ridiculous costume, complete with a helmet that's just a little over the top, isn't even close to the silliest thing that Colin Baker would wear on the show. Your death will be far from dignified and painless. Ark of Infinity is quite average. It's not terrible, but certainly not amazing. If it was Batman, it would be Val Kilmer. For every element of design or special effect that works, there's another that's underwhelming. Omega's new costume looks suitably evil, but his reanimated chicken henchman should have stayed in the coop. Guest star Michael Goff had a connection to Doctor Who in that he had at one time been married to Annika Wills who played Polly in the 60s. Of course, a lot of people know him better as Alfred from the 90s Batman movies. Didn't I tell you? I got the sack! <laughs> so you're stuck with me, aren't you? 
So it seems. Snake Dance is a direct sequel to last season's metaphysical offering, Kinder. Tegan is once again under the spell of the Mara and diverts the Tardis to the planet Manusa, where the Mara had been thought defeated 500 years earlier. An anniversary ceremony is to be used by the Mara to return, with Tegan infecting the son of the planet's ruler, who is, yes, Martin Clunes. While his wardrobe is suspect, his performance is miles better than Doctor Who usually got from a younger performer at this time. Are you just in to know they are being bored? Yes, do you know, I rather suspect I am. After all, what else is there to do? Even the other sitcom star, known as that guy from Bread, is better than we'd usually see in this type of role. It's a well-cast story, but the luck of the draw means that clips of Snake Dance are occasionally trotted out to embarrass Clunes when he appears on a talk show. Oh, Martin. The Doctor tries to warn the locals about the Mara's impending return. It must be called off, at least until my companion is found. Oh, certainly. What? I cancel the whole thing, at once. And now my assistant will show you out. And of course, he comes across as a raving lunatic who's really quite easy to ignore. Davison trying to play authoritative rarely comes across that well. Kill the Mara will reoccur as a physical fact! But never this poorly. Kill them. Maybe that explains why he's always being sentenced to death. Like, a lot. The Fifth Doctor might possibly be the most nearly executed Doctor ever. Not again. In trying to work out how to defeat the Mara, the Doctor gives Tegan an iPod to listen to car music to distract her. Hello. Is it me you're looking for? Snake Dance is not a favourite of mine for various reasons. The banter between the guest cast is great, and its production design is quite decent for the time. However, I've never been enamoured with the forgettable plot and a climax that seems a little stagey. Christopher Bailey had had a difficult time working on his first story for the show, but apparently found Snake Dance a much easier time. He'd written the story to better suit the production's resources, so the snakes aren't so big, but honestly, they're only slightly less shash compared to Kinder. Mordrin Undead by sometimes director, sometimes writer Peter Grimwade is a story of three mysteries. One really interesting, one fairly interesting, and one less than interesting. It's like interviewing the stars of The Three Amigos until you realise one of them is Chevy Chase. Mordrin Undead would be the first of a trilogy of stories that would bring back The Guardians. Back in season 16, the Doctor went on a search for the key to time, at the behest of the White Guardian. Having achieved this, the Doctor was confronted by the White Guardian's opposite number, hang on, the Black Guardian. Years later, he's still harbouring a grudge, like The Rock after he found he wasn't invited to the barbecue at Vin Diesel's house. The TARDIS lands on an ornate but deserted spaceship, with a mysterious transmat capsule aimed at Earth. Meanwhile, a willful schoolboy steals a car and crashes it. Turlow is mysterious, and it's implied he's not from Earth, but if you're expecting any proper origin for him, you'll have to wait until next season. Turlow is offered a deal where if he does a small favour for the Black Guardian, he'll be helped to leave Earth. Then tell me who you are. Your Guardian. One who has your interests at heart. One small problem, that favour is to kill the Doctor. Who are you? Meanwhile, the TARDIS crew are separated, with the Doctor and Turlow heading to Earth in 1983, where they meet one of Turlow's teachers, a retired Brigadier Lethbridge Stewart. Well, who are you? Meanwhile, Tegan and Nyssa have ended up on Earth in 1977, where they also meet a retired Brigadier Lethbridge Stewart. And then there's the injured creature who may or may not be the Doctor. After all, if I was suffering from amnesia, I'd be the first to know about it, wouldn't I? The idea of one of the Doctor's former companions teaching at Turlow School as originally conceived was meant to feature one of the Doctor's first companions, schoolteacher Ian Chesterton, but somewhere along the line the script was tailored to feature the Brigadier, easily the former companion least likely ever to be found teaching in a school. In fact, I would have been less surprised if the former companion turned teacher was Sarah Kingdom. Bless my soul. So you've done it again, Doctor. For non-Brits, Turlow School is a public school, which is really a private school, but it's called a public school, unlike actual public schools which aren't called private schools just to balance things. They also have grammar schools as well, but that doesn't mean people what go there can talk proper and all and stuff and everything like that and shit. Tegan asks the 1977 version of the Brigadier for help with the injured creature in the TARDIS. Rather than immediately call for medical assistance, he takes her into his hut and gives her a drink or two. Five rounds rapid. 
Of course, the injured person isn't the doctor, but in fact, Mordrin, leader of a group of spaghetti-headed scientists who had tried to make themselves immortal with stolen Time Lord regeneration technology. Of course, they found out what a drag it is to live forever, since no matter how good it is, there are only so many times you can watch Frasier over and over again. It is eternal agony. That is why we long for death. Mordrin was of course played by actor David Collings, who had already appeared in Doctor Who a few times, but also in other British sci-fi shows like Sapphire and Steel and Blake 7. But really, you might better recognise his voice. You don't know, monsters! That's my job, master! So of the three mysteries I mentioned earlier, the two better threads involve the 1983 Brigadier and his loss of memory at some point, and that of Mordrin and his associates, who need the Doctor's regeneration energy to help end their lives. Eight of them, eight of me. They want your remaining regenerations. The Turlo plot with the Black Guardian works about as well as going to a naval base, waving your subway card and trying to get a free Italian meatball sub. It's no good, Doctor! Mordrin Undead has nice eccentric designs for the spaceship, which at the time made a big change from the sterile or industrial looking ships we were used to. Of course, it still looks like an airport lounge, but it's a classy one where you get a cheese selection and wine. Mordrin Undead also has one of the better soundtracks this season. It's just a really well-made show for the time. But murder, I'm not sure I could go that far. You will be destroying one of the most evil creatures in the universe. He calls himself the Doctor. Turlo, played by Mark Strickson, was an attempt to do something a little different with a companion. Make them dangerous and unreliable. Of course, if Turlo was to actually fulfill his contract with the Black Guardian, it would have been a very short show. So Turlo ends up being a coward, one who has a decent technical grasp and a fair idea of the universe beyond Earth, but really doesn't know what to do with it. This season, we learn very little about him. He doesn't like Earth, and as far as his school is concerned, he's an orphan that has his needs taken care of by a rather odd solicitor. His full origins would be revealed next season, and only revealed in his last story, Destroy him now! Of course, as someone tasked with killing the Doctor, the problem then becomes, how do we stop him from killing the Doctor? Turlo's natural cowardice and laziness are one way, and having him separated from the Doctor is another. As a mechanism for murder, Turlo seems about as effective as a soap bubble. What more do you want of me? You will remain on the ship and witness the nemesis of the Doctor. Terminus teaches us what goes up must come down. It's Sarah Sutton's last story, with the decision for Nyssa to leave being made from the production office. For various reasons, Nyssa spends most of the story being ill while romping around in her grandmother's underwear. Turlo still trying somewhat half-heartedly to kill the doctor. I mean, if his heart was really in it, he could have killed the doctor a million times. I mean, he's in space, no one's going to arrest him. Turlo sabotages the TARDIS, which then latches onto the nearest spaceship, which turns out to be carrying sick people to a larger vessel, Terminus, where there's apparently a cure for Laz's disease. We're all going to die! On Terminus, the staff are more or less slaves and not too interested in whether or not the cure works. What is this horrendous place? Meanwhile, the Doctor meets up with space pirates Kari and Olvia, and what the hell are they wearing? No, seriously, what the hell are they wearing? It's like someone drew something on a napkin at the pub and didn't show anyone until they got to the studio. In fact, the costumes all probably looked good on paper, but in reality, they look cheesier than the countryside in a three mile radius around that cheese factory that blew up. The veneer look sort of cool, but their radiation armor batters like a cheap Halloween costume, and no one thought how they could speak without having to lift their visor. Terminus is apparently at the exact center of the universe, and part of it blew up and caused the Big Bang thanks to time travel and some other convenient hand waving. And now the other engine looks like it will go foom. Whereas the first explosion created the universe, the second would undoubtedly destroy it. And then the GAM comes in. The GAM is an enslaved creature that apparently administers the haphazard cure. But crucially, he looks like a giant dog. Not so much Hodor as Hodog. Is this necessary? He's probably meant to be a little scarier than he is, but as long as he doesn't try to hump the TARDIS, I think we're cool. 
Terminus was a problem production. Sets that weren't constructed probably throughout intricate studio plans, they lost several hours in the studio due to technical problems, and a remounted session was required. A strike at the BBC also didn't help that much, and this industrial action would have consequences for the rest of the season. Experienced director Mary Ridge was new to Doctor Who, but had handled several demanding episodes of Blake 7, where she had directed the episodes where both of that series' hero ships were destroyed. But apparently Doctor Who, when it went wrong in the studio, was a nightmare where even the most seasoned director could become unstuck. Terminus writer Steve Gallagher had previously written the mysterious story Warrior's Gate from the 18th season. And while there are some good ideas in Terminus, it starts to unravel once they arrive at the titular vessel. Guest artist Lisa Goddard was a familiar face on television, appearing several times in Bergerac, but had also appeared in the 1960s series Skippy. Terminus also deals with the problem of what to do with so many companions and guest characters in a fairly unimaginative way, by having Tegan and Turlo completely divorced from the main plot by crawling around vents and corridors for the bulk of the story. This could have been an opportunity to have them bond in a meaningful way. You're weird, Turlo. Instead, their scenes are like a collection of quick cutaways with absolutely no meaning. Like when you're driving along the highway and you see someone stopped by the side of the road. And before you have a chance to think about stopping and offering assistance, you've passed them and completely forgotten them five minutes later. You heartless bastard, I could have used some help calling for roadside assistance since I didn't have my phone with me. Let's go back. No! I've enjoyed every moment of my time on the TARDIS and I'll miss you both. But here I have a chance to put into practice the skills I learnt on Traken. Package deals are available for travel to Terminus. For 29999999, you can get one-way flights, seven nights accommodation with included continental breakfast and a complimentary treatment for Lazar's disease by a giant flea-ridden dog. I shall not say that again. Kill the doctor! Enlightenment is what they call in the cask wine industry, good piss. It's supposed to be what they give the crew. The White Guardian attempts to warn the Doctor about some danger and the TARDIS lands on what looks like an Edwardian yacht during a race. The crew don't know too much and the officers are just this side of creepy. Like when you visit a waxworks museum and only you can see the exhibits winking at you. The yacht is not what it seems. The crew are actual humans crewing the vessels, but the officers are Eternals, not those ones. Powerful beings who cannot entertain themselves without the thoughts of ephemeral humans. There's no malice, yet the Eternals, with their great power, are somewhat patronising. Superior beings do not punish inferiors. A bit like a Kardashian trying to empathise with a Walmart cashier. The captain of the yacht is racing others like himself, super-powered blank slates, who are competing in any number of sailing vessels from Earth's history. We're not on a yacht, we're on a ship. A spaceship. The prize, it seems, is enlightenment. One of the Eternals is playing the game a little more aggressively than the others. Doctor Who at this time only occasionally dabbled in concepts being more tangible. This is a story that's more towards fantasy than pure science fiction, but not quite as overtly as some eras of the show. Enlightenment was, and I'll use a caveat here, probably the first story written by a woman, Barbara Clegg, was directed by Fiona Cumming and featured a female villain. It's easily the best story of this season, with an interesting plot for each of the characters. Tegan has her eternal stalker fan, who's utterly besotted with Tegan. He literally wants her for her mind. Turlo is trying to find his place in the universe. I mean, he doesn't want to kill the Doctor, but he's also not 100% sold on being a cosmic do-gooder, feeling out whether he could benefit from the eternal Captain Rack, who also seems to serve the Black Guardian. Linda Barron was probably best known at the time for appearing in Ronnie Barker's sitcom Open All Hours, but she'd previously worked on Doctor Who, not on screen, but as the singer heard on the soundtrack of the 1966 story, The Gunfighters. Baron chews the scenery, and it's nice scenery. The BBC never had a hard time realising period settings. The special effects are generally better than you'd expect, though they have a quaint visual effects department feel about them. Industrial action nearly wiped out this story, with revised studio sessions meaning some roles had to be recast due to actor availability. What's a little naff? The vacuum chamber with its giant lever, looking like a hand-me-down from Land of the Giants. Here's a story from the season where nearly everything worked. The cast each had meaty enough roles and the BBC managed a reasonably high quality production. 
It's also a rare example of a story where there had been an attempt at atmospheric lighting. Compare the TARDIS console room in limp home mode here to the drab look it normally had in other shows of this season. The Guardians play a much bigger role in this story and both the white and black Guardian appear together. Both were played by the same actors who'd played the roles in 1978. Valentine Dial with his booming voice is mostly great. The Guardians, for whatever reason, now have dead birds on their heads. Normally when I have a dead bird on my head, I would scream like a child until somebody disposed of it. But these two pros just get on with the job. Turlow would later become a noted writer of spy fiction. His best known works revolve around the super spy Tyler in novels such as Yellow Streak, Hasty Retreat from Fortress Evil and the classic Oh God, Please Don't Kill Me, I Surrender. The King's Demons wasn't meant to be the season closer. That's just how things worked out. The TARDIS lands in 13th century England at a time when even the locals would pine for the good old days of the 12th century. Kids these days with their newfangled pubic lice. King John is holding court in the castle of one of his noblemen. The problem is, according to history, he's supposed to be in London. King John is a rather bloodthirsty fellow, singing a song about killing and conquest, and has an equally loathsome champion with an outrageous French accent. To be held in custody against your continued good behaviour toward our sovereign lord, the king. The Dr. Tegan and Turlow arrive in the middle of a tournament Shit, did you see that? and find King John is rather amused by them, dubbing them his demons, and invites them to dinner. Putting on a spread for the king in 1215 involved 12 courses, 10 of them boar-based. There was boar on a spit, boar soup, boar salad, boar kebabs, boar stew, boar your base, and boar surprise. The surprise being it's chicken wrapped in bacon. But something is still not right, and of course, yes, it was the master in disguise for no readily apparent reason. He's angling to interfere with Magna Carta. King John is also not what he seems. We'll put the unknown world to rest on. He is in fact a shape-shifting robot called Chameleon. After a fairly simple battle of wills, the Doctor bundles Chameleon into the TARDIS and the robot asks to join the crew over Tegan's objections. Why over Tegan's objections? Have you been watching for the last two seasons? She objects to everything, so much so you'd think she'd been binge watching Rumpole of the Bailey. If you're new to 80s episodes of Doctor Who, you might be thinking, wow, I wonder where this is going. And if you have seen the next season, you know that Chameleon doesn't appear again for quite a while. And even then, only to be written out. Chameleon was supposed to be a pre-programmed robot, but in 1983, even if absolutely everything went right, Chameleon was never going to be more than a glorified puppet with limited movement. And of course, everything didn't go right. In fact, nothing went right with Chameleon. The amount of downtime due to technical issues meant a robotic companion was not viable, especially one that seems to have needed, ooh, another 25 years in the oven. Chameleon was voiced by character actor Gerald Flood, who also played King John in this show. Chameleon's character was an easily led but slightly unreliable companion, which was unfortunate since we already had one of those. Allowing Chameleon and Turlo on board the TARDIS at the same time must surely call into question the Doctor's judgement, since basically both characters had worked for the Doctor's enemies. It would be like JFK hiring Lee Harvey Oswald as his bodyguard. I've had quite enough of you, whoever you are! So don't try me too far! Turlo! Medieval misfits! The strikes this season had several knock-on effects beyond delays to studio sessions. The intended season closer, a four-part story by Eric Sayward called Warhead, was cancelled and would be made the following season as Resurrection of the Daleks. Davison's second season was all over the place, like a spaghetti dinner served on a yacht during a storm in the middle of the Atlantic. Arc of Infinity was fun enough, but generally quite ordinary. Snake Dance was aiming higher than usual, but fell to earth like a stone. Mordron Undead is a genuinely good story, well made and enjoyable to watch. 
Terminus is like having dinner with your least favourite in-laws. You just can't wait till it's over. Enlightenment is the season's highlight, like getting to the top of Mount Everest without tripping over a single frozen corpse. The King's Demons feels like a shallow palate cleanser before the main course, which was a Dalek story that, unlike the last story to be cancelled due to strike action, would actually see the light of day the following year. All in all, season 20 was a bit of a muddle. The next season would, in places, be a step up in many ways. But the way TV worked, Peter Davison had to decide whether he would sign on for a fourth year during the making of this season, which was one he generally did not enjoy. If we don't do something quickly, the whole universe will be destroyed. The season had rated well, though of course with it now being screened twice weekly, was already over by March of 1983. While the 20th season of the show had been relatively ordinary in terms of overall quality, the BBC would pull out all of the stops, or at least as many stops as they deemed necessary, for Doctor Who to celebrate its history with a 90-minute special shown on or near the show's actual 20th anniversary in November of that year. The five Doctors would attempt to bring back as many Doctors, companions and creatures as possible, and at the same time attempt a coherent story with an exciting plot. Okay then. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe, leave a comment below or check out some of our other videos.